president adds John Dean to his inner circle. He asks the young attorney to manage the Watergate scandal by controlling the flow of information in and out of the White House. After Nixon wins his landslide victory, uh, he's not quite sure what is going to happen with Watergate, but he's quite sure what he wants to have happen. He wants it ended. I, in essence, had become the desk officer for the cover-up. January 30th, the jury in Lydian McCord's Watergate trial finds them both guilty of conspiracy, burglary, and wiretapping. But the trial ends without any proof of a larger conspiracy. Judge Sirica urges the U.S. Senate to look deeper into Watergate, saying, quote, I am still not satisfied that the pertinent facts have been produced before an American jury. February 7th, the Senate creates a committee to determine if Richard Nixon's last campaign involved illegal activity. They also hope to answer the question, did President Nixon play any role in the Watergate break-in? March 23rd, at the sentencing hearing of all the Watergate conspirators, Judge Sureka reads a letter in open court from James McCord, one of the burglars. McCord says, quote, there was political pressure applied to the defendants to plead guilty and remain silent. This letter hints at a larger conspiracy and ignites national interest in Watergate. April 6th, John Dean, the young White House counsel, approaches Senate investigators. Dean is convinced that the Watergate cover-up is spiraling out of control. He offers to tell them everything he knows. April 17th, the president, aware that Dean is talking to the Watergate investigators, no longer trusts him. In a private meeting, Nixon asks Dean to resign. He then passes me a letter across his desk uh, where he's got it drafted, and it's just a, a, an open confession. Nixon tells Dean that he is also planning to remove his top aides, Haldeman and Ehrlichman. Dean knows that the two men are also involved in the cover-up, yet he suspects that he will be the president's lone fall guy. This isn't an acceptable role for me. And I said, well, I'd like to have a letter that says that Haldeman and Ehrlichman are resigning as well. April 29th. Camp David, Maryland. In what he calls one of the most difficult decisions of his career, Richard Nixon asks Haldeman and Ehrlichman for their resignations. In his memoirs, the president writes that he told the men, quote, when I went to bed last night, I had hoped and almost prayed that I wouldn't wake up this morning. The next day, the president tells the nation that he now believes his own staff was involved in the Watergate cover-up. There had been an effort to conceal the facts, both from the public, from you, and from me. Why does Nixon decide to dismiss his closest aides? May 17th, the Senate Watergate hearings begin. All three commercial networks air the hearings live. The hearings dominated this town. They had this town by the throat. You wouldn't date anybody that didn't want to talk about this. There'd be no point. The next day, Attorney General Elliot Richardson appoints Archibald Cox as special prosecutor and orders him to explore the president's connection to Watergate. Nixon is now facing both a criminal probe from the Justice Department and a political inquiry in the Senate. 38 days later, the one-time close aide to the president, John Dean, is set to testify before the Senate Watergate Committee. It became clear once he decided to testify, he was going to let it all hang out. That shocking testimony and the answers to all of our questions are next on The Final Report. June 25th, 1973, Washington, D.C. A standing room only crowd waits for President Nixon's former legal counsel, John Dean, to testify in front of the Senate Watergate Committee. Counsel will call the first witness, Mr. John W. Dean III. I sincerely wish I could say it's my pleasure to be here today, but I think you can understand why it's not. For almost eight hours, Dean reads a 245-page statement before a national TV audience. He outlines what the president called, quote, his dirty tricks campaign. The revised domestic intelligence plan called for bugging, burglarizing. P-51 
people at home watching it live on television were just glued. June 28th. Republican Senator Howard Baker asked Dean the question on everyone's mind. The central question at this point is simply put, what did the president know and when did he know it? July 16th. The committee calls the president's little-known deputy assistant, Alexander Butterfield. Republican counsel Fred Thompson is the first to question him. Mr. Butterfield, are you aware of the installation of any listening devices in the Oval Office of the President? I was aware of listening devices. Yes, sir. What prompts the committee to ask about listening devices in the Oval Office? I was sitting next to Mary McGrory, a famous Washington reporter. I said, did I hear right? Did I hear right? If there are tapes, oh my goodness. What, 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 what has Nixon said on the tapes? You understand the problem we have here. The news of the secret taping shocks the president's staff. I felt betrayed because the whole idea of being able to be an advisor to the president is that you can talk candidly to the president. Why is the president taping his conversations? Special Prosecutor Archibald Cox plans to subpoena the White House tapes, but he doesn't for another week. Until then, Richard Nixon is not obligated to turn them over. He could have had a bonfire on the White House lawn and burned them and could have gotten away with it. Why doesn't Nixon destroy the tapes? July 23rd, Cox subpoenas the tapes. Nixon refuses to release them for months. October 20th, in a desperate move, the president orders Attorney General Elliot Richardson to fire the special prosecutor. Richardson and his deputy refuse to do it. They resign instead. Finally, the Solicitor General, Robert Bork, agrees to fire Cox. The press calls the event the Saturday Night Massacre. The firing sparked anger around the country. There's talk in Washington that the president might face impeachment if he continues to stonewall the investigation. Nixon's staff catalogs and transcribes the tapes. November 21st, the administration announces there's a problem. The White House says that when Nixon's secretary, Rosemary Woods, was transcribing the tapes, she accidentally erased an 18 and a half minute section. She reenacts the moment in a move the press instantly terms the Rosemary Stretch. Was the tape deliberately erased? February 6th, 1974. Nixon has dodged federal subpoenas for six months. The House of Representatives, by a vote of 410 in favor to four opposed, instructs the Judiciary Committee to consider articles of impeachment. April 30th, Nixon releases edited transcripts of the White House tapes to the public. The tapes themselves are not released, but Americans are surprised by the president's vulgar language. There were these parties where, if transcripts came out, we would sit in a circle and read them out loud. They were filled with expletive deleteds and things, so there'd be a lot of laughter. July 24th, the U.S. Supreme Court orders Richard Nixon to release the White House tapes. It was the knockout blow. If we didn't have the tapes, I don't know whether we would have gotten them or not. He hung himself, really, with his own tape, which is the, one of the tragedies of Watergate. Of all the tapes, a recording from June 23rd, 1972, is the most devastating. The press labels it the smoking gun because it proves that the president obstructed justice six days after the break-in. In a meeting on that day with his chief of staff, Nixon says that an FBI investigation would expose the burglars, since four of them are former CIA agents involved in the failed 1961 Bay of Pigs operation in Cuba. Nixon tells Haldeman to call CIA Director Richard Helms and persuade the agency to halt the FBI probe using a cover story. In this conversation, 
the President of the United States is telling his Chief of Staff to interfere with the Watergate investigation. This is a clear violation of the law. But CIA Director Helms refuses to go along with Nixon's plan. July 27. The House Judiciary Committee passes an article of impeachment against the president for obstruction of justice. Within three days, Congress passes two more articles of impeachment, one for abuse of power and another for contempt of Congress. Mr. Drinan. Aye. Mr. Rangel. Aye. The full House is scheduled to address the articles in two weeks. With the threat of impeachment looming, what is the president's state of mind? Nine days later, on August 8, 1974, Nixon addresses the nation. I have never been a quitter. To leave office before my term is completed is abhorrent to every instinct in my body. But as president, I must put the interests of America first. America needs a full-time president and a full-time Congress. Therefore, I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. By resigning, he avoids a likely impeachment and trial in the Senate. Would the Senate have removed Nixon from office? More than three decades after Watergate, questions remain. As we examine them, we reveal the larger conspiracy, hidden agendas, and a president's desperate struggle to survive. Our answers begin with the break-in at the Watergate. What were the burglars looking for? One theory is that they wanted information on Democratic National Committee Chairman Larry O'Brien. O'Brien, at the time, was giving the White House fits. He was probably the most visible and vocal spokesperson for the Democratic Party, and he is a threat to the, the, the president. But at the time, O'Brien and the Democrats did not pose a major threat. Nixon held a double-digit lead over Democratic candidate George McGovern. So why did members of the Committee to Re-elect the President resort to illegal tactics? Nixon didn't just want to win the election, he wanted to win big. That's what some people don't know about Nixon. He wanted to win the election by the greatest margin ever in a presidential election. To help achieve a landslide over the Democrats in November, the committee hired a former FBI agent and current White House staff assistant, G. Gordon Liddy. Liddy's job was simple gather intelligence on Richard Nixon's enemies. The committee gave Liddy a budget of $250,000 and permission to break into the Democratic National Committee headquarters. Liddy brought in former CIA operative Howard Hunt to help him carry out the mission. Nixon set the tone for his re-election committee. He was a man driven by mistrust and anger. What was Nixon paranoid about? He worried that his enemies and leaks to the press would undermine his international agenda. When Nixon took office in 1969, he inherited the Vietnam War, which deeply divided the nation. Nixon didn't want to tarnish his legacy by being the first president to lose a war. It couldn't have been a more dangerous time. There were times when I would stand there on the White House lawn and wonder, can this country survive? June 13, 1971. The New York Times published the so-called Pentagon Papers, top-secret documents that showed the government's calculated expansion of the war in the years leading up to the Nixon administration. Nixon believed their disclosure threatened national security. Daniel Ellsberg, a former military analyst, stole the papers from a think tank and leaked them. Nixon called it, quote, the most massive leak of classified documents in American history. We didn't know what else he had. And I was in the president's office one moment when he said, uh, Chuck, we've got to do whatever it takes to stop this man. 